Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. We are more or less on time, but we have a tight schedule. So we move on uh, as fast as possible, but we still have time to have uh, four contribution <laughs> before lunch. And since they are before lunch, I invite the speakers to be quick because you know that people, <laughs> when they, we get close to lunch, there is a it may be a small drop of attention. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you so much. And uh, you have uh, 20 minutes, more or less. And I have here that the next presentation will be by Neboisa, but I. I uh, who, is, who is going to. You. You will give the, the first contribution. Yeah. And. Uh, Ah, okay, yes, 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 yes. you okay. Yeah, okay. Another neighbor is Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not a mistake. <laughs> Two neighbors. Um, I was confused for a moment, maybe you are confused too, but here we go okay. with the boys and Naki Dakinesovitz. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here on so far very inspirational meeting and look forward to the rest of the proceedings. Let me at the beginning thank the Academy, Club of Rome and UNESCO for organizing this relevant meeting and in particular Nebo Shaneshkovic, that was the source of the confusion, my close friend and his colleagues for organizing I think brilliant meeting. Uh, so what I would like to do is uh, I've chosen perhaps a I thought provocative title. I no longer think so after the sessions this morning. I think we need to transform the science in order to be able to be ready for the transformation to sustainable development that's ahead of us. But before I do that, before I argue about it, let me just uh, briefly recognize limits to growth. And I also have a personal reason for doing that, not only because Club of Rome is here strongly represented. It has been 50 years, and Carlos has shown this iconic graph of the scenarios of the Club of Rome, of one of the scenarios of the Club of Rome, and I would argue it was pretty much straight on the target, if you really think in the qualitative, in the dynamic, in the transformational sense. And I will not go into the detail, but the green line is roughly where we are today, and we have a tall order ahead of us, and I think that's still really relevant. And the reason why I'm mentioning this 50 years, half a century later, is that in 1972, I worked at the Nuclear Research Center in Karlsruhe. And I remember really vigorous and controversial discussions. We had an institute about this publication. But for me, it was a fundamental paradigm change. It is at that time that I thought, I also have to work on this kind of major problems facing humanities. And a year later, IASA was organized, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, based on the discussions between Premier Kosygin and President Johnson a few years before that, with exactly the common roots with the Club of Rome. I need to mention that as well. But Che was one of the key people, uh, so was Guigiani on beh behalf of the Soviet Union. And so I thought I need to work there, <clears throat> also because of the limits of, uh, to growth. And um, luckily, then the, there was a global modeling program there where Dana Meadows and Dennis participated, so did Mezarovic and Pestel. Uh, Forrester with his colleagues. So that was a great learning experience. And let me just share with you uh, this um, message that Dana wrote to her friends back in 1887. Uh, she said that she's going to IASA, and the reason, one of the reasons besides science, why she likes going there, <coughs> is that she has friends from Poland, from Russia, from other Eastern European countries. And I think we need more of that today. I think this is really our challenge. Science needs to be inclusive. It cannot afford to have any borders. So I think this is at least me, for me the lasting message. And let me start by highlighting, I think, one of the great successes of, of science. So I'm going in the wrong direction here. Apo apologies for that. <laughs> that um, Gary already mentioned in his presentation before, uh, the polio vaccine. 
Um, at the time where Dana Meadows wrote that message to her friends, there were 350,000 polio infections in the world. Last year, almost none. And this is a poster from the science uh, March for Science. So I think this is a great success. If you think about the COVID infection, in, in a brief period, unbelievably brief period, we had the vaccines. I mean, these are all great successes of, the, uh, of science. But however, there are of course huge challenges as we discussed this morning. Uh, so what Gary called the double edge of science, I call paradox of science and knowledge accumulation in general. It solves the problems. We are here because of science to the largest extent. But there also, science generates new problems as it solves the old ones. Uh, in economics, we call them negative externalities. So when, they pro when the science produces a solution, it usually later on generates also problems. And of course, nuclear power and peaceful use of nuclear energy, a typical example. Uh, I think the, 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 other, the, the other dimension of science that is really important I would like to highlight is that the science is the key source of knowledge, but it is also a mediator in the sense that it's a mediator between us humans, environment, and in the larger sense, the whole universe. So it's a human-made resource, and I think that's important because it is cumulative, means it needs to be sustained, but it's also not limited by the usual resources that other form of human activities are. And then last but not least, I think the current challenge is, one can almost call it also a paradox, is that for the problems that are facing humanity, we, we need integrated interdisciplinary and holistic science. So the, in order to tackle the huge problems that the world has, yet we work in disciplines, we work in the departments. I'm not saying that that's not good. I mean, this is really important, but we need a horizontal. The horizontal is the challenge, I think, uh, of integrated interdisciplinary and holistic approaches. And so this caricature, in my view, somehow illustrates this, what, we, uh, what is ahead of us. Uh, we have wars, pandemics, immediate threats is the climate change that is lasting. Uh, and at the same time, we have the injustice, inequality, and ever increasing pressure on the earth systems. That's our challenge. And I think that this caricature is, uh, describes this very well. We cannot solve these problems in isolation. We need to solve them together. That's the point I would like to make. And um, one could say that in that sense, perhaps we are at the crossroads. At least I think we are at the crossroads. We have experienced explosive development. Some people call that the great acceleration of last half century since the limits to growth were published. The huge acceleration that is testing the planetary boundaries. We are exceeding some of them. But what is really tragic that few have benefited, but many are left behind. And I think that this is yet another challenge for the science ahead of us. Just to illustrate you the great success on the positive side, global economy grew 100 times, so about 100 trillion today. So on average, we are all rich, but we know what the problems are. So I'm not going to comment. But the good news is that the energy grew only about 50 times in quotes, meaning we are ever more efficient in using energy. And even carbon, carbon grew about 30 times. So we are even more efficient in using carbon. So these are some of the really great new uh, news on the dark side, temperature today has increased the global mean temperature by about 1.3 degrees above the pre-industrial. IPCC concludes 1.2. I'm not going to bicker about 0.1 degrees, but it is important. Every point tenth of a degree is crucial in the sense of what the consequences are. And another tragedy, and I think perhaps even more immediate, is that 8 million people in the world die prematurely from indoor air pollution because they heat with unsustainable fossil energy and another 4 million through the regional air pollution. So we need to fight that at the same time as we are reducing the emissions of the greenhouse gases. And um, just, I, I think, you know, just to conclude that thought, I think that the achievement of the Agenda 2030, uh, 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement is central to bringing those multiple benefits uh, of the next transformation for, for, the, for the people and the planet. And so one could almost, almost say, in my view, even though we are really late with implementing 2030 Agenda, way behind the schedule, it is still, in my view, a huge gift to humanity. 
So let me share this graph with you to, to illustrate some of these challenges. So what you see here on the horizontal scale is the time before present since the beginning, since the last ice age, 20,000 years ago. Vertical scale is the global mean temperature in degrees Celsius. And please note the last 8,000 years or so, how horizontal the temperature was during the Holocene. This is the cradle of humanity. This is where we settled down produced the agriculture, early civilization, the Neolithic Revolution, the first revolution in our development, at least on my count. And you see the hockey stick of emissions going up in the Anthropocene, the age where we dominate the planetary processes. And the blue range is the Paris Agreement. So we are very close and we are going to exceed the Paris Agreement hopefully before going down to one and a half degrees in the long-term future. And what I would like to illustrate here is some of the tipping points in the Earth system, meaning that the regime of the Earth system might be changing irreversibly to, un to other conditions that are probably all of them not beneficial to humanity. I will just mention five that you're probably all familiar with. West Antarctic ice sheet is already melting now in current temperature rate. Greenland ice as well, Arctic ice in particular, uh, Barents Sea, Alpine glaciers, um, coral reefs, and there are a number of other tipping points that are very close if we exceed the Paris range. So I think that's a challenge ahead of us and it's symbolic for many others that we have. And without science, we will not be able to resolve those. So, if climate is one of the central problems, which I think they are, this is one ton of carbon dioxide, just that you have an impression. On average, each of us emits two of those per year. Rich, of course, many dozen. Those who are excluded and disfranchised, probably a couple of hundred kilograms or even less. And they bear very little responsibility for the cumulative challenge of global change. So how can science contribute? Well, I, well, I would argue that we have pretty robust knowledge of what needs to be done, how is ahead of us. And I think this is where inclusive science can help. Um, what you see here is these 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide that we emit, 40 billion of those spheres. And um, this is a paper we published five years ago in Nature, in Science, and we called it the Carbon Law. And this has been basically confirmed with the IPCC in the last assessment report. The reason why we called it Carbon Law is that if you are going to achieve Paris range, emissions need to be halved every century, uh, every decade, I'm sorry. So from 40 billion tons today to 20 billion tons down, down to 10, and eventually by 2050, about zero. But this is just number one. Unfortunately, there is a number two that's shown here in blue and green, as you can see. Mother Earth removes about half of our emissions, but those processes are weakening as we are threatening the Earth systems. So, so the absorption of the ecosystems and the oceans of carbon dioxide is likely to decline. And so we need to offset that. Uh, otherwise, we'll be way beyond the Paris Agreement. We need to offset that with a so-called net negative emission. This could be nature-based solutions like afforestation, but perhaps also carbon capture and storage from sustainable biomass. So we have three challenges ahead of us, at least on my clock. And again, I would argue that 2030 agenda with its 17 SDGs is central to this challenge. Uh, and this is one of my favorite figures about the uh, 17 SDGs from a conference in Copenhagen on the synergies. It shows them a little bit unorderly, but if you look at 13 in the foreground and seven, climate and energy, it's clear that they're strongly linked and so are all of them. And so I would argue agenda, 2030 agenda is indivisible. It is a holistic approach, but we have to produce holistic science for that. And some of us have tried to do that in an activity called the world in 2050 over the last 10 years or so, we've been working on this, we've published three reports, and one of our conclusions of our analysis is that there are six transformations that are key to achieving the sustainable development goals. And I will not go through the details, but I think, you know, it's obvious that human capacity, demography are the key, consumption production, in particular circular economy, decarbonizing energy and other human activities, sustainable food, biosphere, and water, then smart cities and mobility, more than half of the people live in the urban areas already, and 
perhaps most significantly the digital revolution that's ahead of us. And perhaps the digital revolution is the part of the solution, but we also know that it will bring many problems, so it needs to be socially steered in the right direction. So for me, all of this, and I think for many other analysts, happen, happened here 200 years ago with the first steam railway. That was the source of the Industrial Revolution that really changed our lifestyles. So I think this is really important not to see technology as an external man manifestation. It's part of our human activities. The next one I would like to highlight, just for the purposes of an argument, very briefly, is one of my favorite pictures, what is the replacement of horses and carriages by car. On the left side, you see 1900, the Easter parade on the Fifth Avenue. Uh, if you have good eyesight, maybe you'll spot one or two motor vehicles, but that's about it. And on the right, it's very difficult to spot 13 years later any horses and carriages. So that was a huge solution of an environmental problem, of manure in the streets, in all of the big cities. And yet, it generated later new problems. This is this double, so, double edge or, or paradox of science, as we know, air pollution later on when automobiles diffused. So I would like to briefly conclude, I have about six minutes left, with the power of the digital revolution that I think is ahead of us. So Neolithic, industrial, and my argument would be digital revolution. We just have to make sure that it's steered in the right direction. And I would like to illustrate very briefly here with this picture how big the power is potentially. So this is what already occurred in the digitalization. In the middle, you see a number of analog and digital devices that many of us have at home. Their power requirement is about 550 watts. And then, compared to that, a mobile phone that started with the Motorola 30 years ago, and today requires about one hundredth of the energy. That means also one hundredth of the emissions by providing even more services. And what is incredibly significant is that everybody in the world has a mobile phone, including the billion people or so who do not have access to electricity. One just has to internalize that idea how important this technological revolution was that took 30 years and has changed our lives. And I expect that the next wave of technologies will go in that direction. So again, let me just share a couple of examples with you to illustrate the argument. Yep. Thank you. My clock, I have four minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Just Thank you very much. So uh, I'll be very quick. So in the, in the blue area are some, some uh, new forms of going from the ownership to usership that would reduce the resource requirements, then the shared economy in red, and I think most significant are examples of the connected through digitalization systems. I think all of those together I hold the promise of reducing the emissions and reducing the impact on the environment, and yet they will be changing our lifestyles, just like the mobile telephone and internet did. So to conclude, uh, I would like to say that this is why I think we need integrated and holistic science. This is all about the evolution of values and norms, not just technology and machines. Um, we need socially uh, responsible behaviors that can recognize the ir irreversibility of the destruction of the social and economic environments. Uh, I would argue that science is central to this transformation uh, to achieve the 2030 Agenda and 17 goals. And for that reason, the science needs to be transformed to be fit for this incredible challenge ahead of us to provide evidence-based advice on the way forward. Um, European Green Deal that was mentioned today, I think is a very important step in that direction and I would like to highlight the Bauhaus initiative that some of you might be familiar with. This is the idea to organize our whole environment in such a way of reusing, being more efficient, a little bit like a movement. It's deeply embedded in the Green Deal, but I would like to highlight the three dimensions of the Bauhaus, new Bauhaus idea. Sustainability, I would say that's almost clear. Inclusion, very important. But third one, we usually don't talk about. It's not enough that everybody has the bare bones. We need to have decent life for everybody. I think this is, means we have to carry the society with us. So the third, the third qualifier is actually aesthetics and the beauty, that the life needs to be beautiful. And that's part, I think, of the co-benefits that the 
um, that the next revolution might bring with us. Uh, let me conclude with this slide that I think sometimes people say, uh, pictures say thousand words. Um, if you see horizontally, there are five areas of human activity here in periods of 50 years, railways, then flying machines, um, telecommunication, individual mobility, and then industrial processes. I think you would agree that in 50 years they have fundamentally changed, and what is important is the systemic, the vertical. Now, nobody knows what will happen in 2050, but I would argue for the sustainability revolution and the digital revolution, we will new, need new systems that can combine together. So I would like to conclude here. Science, we need to support science because science supports us. It's our future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would go on with the talks and we leave the questions for the end of the session. So the next one. Thank you. Thank you. And you have about 20 minutes. Great. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Um, I, it looks like I think you're doing fairly well to be still staying awake. But can I just invite you just to stand up? Just please, everybody stand up. I'm going to risk it. Stand up. Just stand, just stand up. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> Everyone stand up. Okay, if you can. Up. Okay. Shake around a bit. Mm -hmm. Shake. 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 Move your arms. Oh, now you can sit down again. Perfect. Right, I've changed the room. That's good. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get that right. Okay, so I, 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 after last night, I thought about how am I going to talk about what I want to talk about. And I thought it, it really struck me the depth of knowledge and expertise that we have in the room. We've got a phenomenal amount of wisdom here coming from so many different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. I thought, well, I don't want to talk about to you. I want to talk about me to give you some insights about from my own learning of how I've tried to navigate some of the challenges that I've faced. Being an academic and researcher, trying to think about how I can do things in the best way in order to be able to support change externally in the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. I'm not going to talk about where I came from exactly, but I did start as a natural scientist, a zoologist. I shifted to the social scientist, I did a lot of work in international development, and now I work on how we think about societal change and transformations that we need around that. But through that process, I learned a lot about the meaning and the nature of how we come to know something and what it means to create knowledge. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start from the point, um, which has been made by others in different forms, that transformations in the world are going to be inevitable. They're either going, to come, either going to come from the massive impacts of things like climate change or through the massive changes that you were talking about as we move through digital revolutions or trying to find a way of steering through these challenges. But the point is we are really at the end of the world as we know it. We're in a collapse, as Carlos has said. It's going to change. Everything will change in some form, including science. And I, I, this is a, um, a note, that, a, a picture that was put in a bookshop in Glasgow that a colleague of mine uh, picked up and took a photo of. Um, the post-apocalyptical fiction section has now been moved to current affairs. We're in it. It's now. It's here. And I don't know how you feel, but I often feel like this when I think about that. A minuscule person thinking about how you can do good in the world in the best way possible, and it feels like this is ginormous, sort of massive abyss that we're looking into. And that's real because the challenges that we're experiencing and the change in the pace and scale of that that we're experiencing is like nothing else we've faced before, I think. Maybe we have historically in some forms. Probably not like this when we think about things like climate change. And on reflecting on that, what I realized when I thought about where I fit in this and how I act in this world, I was facing three kinds of emergencies, not just one. So not just one emergency from climate change and the change that we're facing. But as an academic trying to understand how I operate in the world, I was dealing with three kinds of emergencies. The first of the real emergencies, the manifest emergencies. How can I do things better to improve the methods I'm using or the approaches I'm taking, those sorts of things, maybe even the questions I'm asking, in order to do and contribute more to the kinds of challenges that we're facing. 
But there's another emergency, which is the conceptual emergency. In order to address that first emergency, I realized I needed to change a lot in here. We've heard that um, mindsets and things like that change that we might need. So I've had to address some of those things. And then I've realized that there's a third emergency. It's the existential emergency. What is my sense of purpose and who am I at the end of the world as we know it? What does it mean in terms of having to shift my identity in order to be able to allow for the mindset shift to allow for the change in the ways in which I do things? The identity one is a bit like some of the, a couple of the, uh, the uh, fossil fuel based um, companies in the US are trying to shift their identity from one of contributing to the continuous economic growth and being the engine of growth to saying we need to be um, part of the solution and in, in, in terms of that problem. It's through changing one's identity that other things then emerge. So I'm going to talk about each of these things and I'm going to go through them and then some of the insights that I've found have, have helped me in making uh, the shifts that I've thought about. Now much of this, of this has been said, yours was a perfect perfect introduction to my talk um, because what I wanted to say really is of course there's been many benefits of science and research. We're here now because of that and I'm not going to say any more because that's just been said. But we also have to recognise there are many challenges and also this has been said as well. Massive destructive capabilities from science that has allowed us to do things we would never have been able to do without science and technology. And then of course the unintentional impacts like climate change that we're really struggling to think about how we deal with that. The point there when I think about that is we probably can't solve the same kind of the, the problem, we can't solve these problems with the same kind of thinking that has created them. The same kinds of methods and science and technology uh, that has got us there. And of course, as already been said, this is already also tied to power and who wields power, who holds power and so on. So holding that in mind then, that's really the back where I'm, where I'm coming from. This sort of dilemma that there's, there's this phenomenal capacity of science and technology, but also that there are challenges around it. So the first emergency that I was facing was, how do I change what I do? How can I do things differently in terms of research and action that might help it? And here's a few insights that I came up with. What I realized at one point was that I need to approach my research as if I'm an apprentice at the end of the world as we know it. If everything is changing so fast and we can't apply this exactly the same methods, then I need to think differently and I need to take that humility in terms of how I'm approaching things and open things up. And one of the best examples of that happened to me a few years ago was when I was working in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific and I'd been invited a couple of years before to work with a group of elders and communities who were really struggling with the problems that they were facing. So I found myself a job in an academic institution and I wrote lots of grant applications and I managed to get some money to go back out to help them. In the process, what I'd done is I'd created this fantastic survey. I was going to do this survey over 40 different communities. It was, it was brilliantly produced. It took me nine months to produce this survey. And it was all perfect and I was going to do this research and I was going to deliver this survey when I got there. And I arrived after six days of travel. There was a storm, so I had to swim to get to shore to get to this community. <laughs> And I remember sitting after I dried off in the first, when I met these three elders, and I was sitting by lamplight in a little hut, and I looked at them, and I went, oh. So I went to my bag, ripped up the survey, it was a beautiful survey, and I went back to them and I said, how can I help? It was that recognition that what I came in with my knowledge, that I had as much to learn from them as, as, as they might learn from me, and possibly more so. And I think that that was really key. It was recognizing that I can't solve that problems and I've got to relook and rethink about different ways in which my, I might address that. The other one is that I realized very early, relatively early on, or a few years ago, that, that a lot of the questions we're asking are about problems. They're not about how we resolve them, how, how we create solutions, and maybe we're doing lots of that, but less so about how we support the kinds of change we might need in the world. I did a very off-the-back-of-the-envelope calculation about five or six years ago, uh, and I looked at all the 5,500 um, uh, papers that had been produced on climate change uh, that year, and skimmed through the titles and the abstracts. Very quick, this is not reproducible science by any form, um, but I did a very quick calculation, and I roughly came to the solution that about 90% of the papers were on the problems, about 88% 8 8 on solutions, but only 2% on actually how we can make that implement implementation happen or how we can make the change happen. So that's probably changed by now, but the point really is that we're often asking the wrong questions. It's very much about the how do we support the change, how do we move forward, and that's a completely different ball game in terms of how we might approach it. 
The other thing that I learned as well was that I tried very, very hard to bring in very different forms of ways of knowing. So we often rely on evidence from the past, but if we want to get to new futures, we also need real imaginations, imaginations of, of the future that we want to bring into being, that optimism and that hope about what we want to create. And often there's an assumption that we can do that through evidence, but evidence in all its power and its form and its glory is a bit like, if you're using it to, to move forward, it's a bit like driving forwards whilst looking through the rearview mirror. Now evidence is the truth of what we have in the present. It's a real truth that's out there that we can try, and science is fantastic at understanding that. But the imaginary futures that we need are also a form of truth. It's a different kind of truth, though. It's the truth that one holds dear and here. It's kind of what Carlos was saying about that notion of actually allowing people to speak from their heart, not just their heads. And the truth of what we want to see. And that might be subjective. It might be different for different people. But well, actually, most people want the same thing. They want things like security and well-being. That's what they want to see in the world. They want to see peace, most of them. And so, really, it's about finding these different forms of knowledge and integrating them. But the pendulum swings so heavily to one side. That's where we put most of our money, is in one particular form of way of knowing. The other bit that then came out that I realized is it's not really about knowledge. When you bring in that kind of way of thinking, it's actually about wisdom. And Nicholas Maxwell, a philosopher who's, who's been very, working on this stuff for 40, 50 years now, really he makes the point that we need to go well beyond developing knowledge about biophysical phenomena to developing wisdom about how to act in the world. So what is wisdom? Well, wisdom is a combination of really three forms of know knowing that Aristotle talked about. It's the epistemic knowledge, it's the abstract stuff we can produce, the papers, the PowerPoint presentations, those sorts of things which dominate academia, that's mostly what we're doing with students. And there's the technical knowledge, which is the sort of embodied know-how. So if you're learning to, to drive a car, or if you're driving a car, we have this embodied knowledge, we don't have to think about it very much, but it's actually very hard to explain what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's an embodied thing. But then there's also phrenesis, which is a kind of moral ethical knowledge, it's a know-how. So I could be driving a car, picking somebody up from the street, taking them to the hospital, but that's very different from having a bomb in the back of my car, right? So there's a very different notion of things that generate a different kind of wisdom. But it includes those three things. That's what makes us up as hum humans. And Carlos, that's what you mean when you're saying people aren't allowed to bring in their technium phrenesis into the room. It's this epistemic knowledge that dominates academia in, in, a, in a huge, huge form. So, um, there's a challenge there then that I came to, which is those are the sorts of things I've tried to work with, either with my students or with my research and the ways I've done things. But I've come up with so many challenges to do that. The systems and the structures don't allow me to operate in that particular way, the things we've created. So then I started realizing that I had this conceptual problem. Where is this thing coming from that creates the systems and structures that is limiting me to be able to do things differently? And that's what I'll talk about now. One of the things I came to the conclusion was that a lot of it came from a deep and very pre prevalent assumption underpinning science and research. It's not just science. And that is that good research is when we stand from the outside looking in, not getting involved. I'm not going to go into the details, but that's largely a fallacy. I'm not going to go into that now. But essentially, it's been a very powerful way of driving our science. It's been very, very helpful. But it also massively constrains the inclusion of many other forms and ways of knowing. So if I just take the example of the questions about the how, if we want to learn how to, how to work with change, if we want to learn about negotiation, if we want to learn about conflict resolution, you have to get in there and get your hands dirty. It's like, riding to bi it's like learning to ride a bicycle. You have to get on the bicycle and fall off, not just watch a PowerPoint presentation. So a focus and that, that prevalence of that, that very, very powerful assumption, which underpins a lot of our institutions, um, is, 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 is really limiting the kinds of knowledge that we can introduce. It limits, limits bringing this stuff in, the heart stuff in, as well as the head, in the way that Carlos was talking about. It prevents us bringing in what we might really care about, or the imaginary futures that we might want to create. And again, as I said, the pendulum swings very, very heavily towards supporting one form and dominant form of knowledge production. If we want to be able to work with the kinds of challenges we're facing, we've got to open that up massively. In the US, in the 1960s, 
Many of the universities were built very explicitly to be separate from the world of practice. And now we're saying, why have we got these ivory towers? Well, it, was, it came from that, that strong assumption. My salary is based on that assumption. When we have that assumption that, that we can have this form of knowledge we can pass on in an inert form in a, in a lecture theatre, it allows us to fill a lecture theatre with hundreds of students. Not all universities are doing this. <laughs> um, but you can fill up a whole bunch of lecture theatres with lots and lots of students, and it pays the fees to allow us to have large salaries. I suddenly came to the realisation that my salary was based on that assumption. So we've got these real challenges and these systems that are constraining what we were doing. And that then led me to, can I explore and figure out how we could think about a transformational change in the systems and structures um, that, are, that we're, we're dealing with? And this is the work, Carlos, you were involved in this. Uh, in 2007, I got 350 can, uh, uh, participants of a conference together. I brought in 10 professional facilitators and we ran a process to look at using imaginary futures and a whole range of things, a process of how we could imagine a transformation in the way in which we produce and use knowledge in order to support transformations in society. This is just some of the things that come up. You may agree or disagree. I'd love to hear about that afterwards. But that exploration of how would one would get systemic change in, in these kinds of things. Of course, there are many great examples of people doing things differently. As I've said, the pendulum is swung, though, in a very particular direction. And we do need to find a way that allows the whole person to come in. The science that operates as if from within the systems we seek to understand and change, not from the outside looking in. And where we recognize we and the way we think and operate and act are as much a part of the problem as the solution. So that's a, a big, big challenge for us. And then it leads me to my final emergency that I've been facing. As I've grown through that process, I've realized that my identity has to shift. Does it work to be a, a professor standing in front, which is delivering knowledge? And how can I shift that identity? And about four years ago, um, I love talking, putting this up in front of a scientific audience, I actually got involved in learning about um, shamanic practice, an ancient art of, of knowing and understanding and reconnecting with nature. And I've developed my capacity to think, it's not even thinking, it's operating in a very different form and way of knowing completely different from the, role, from the way we think about cognition normally in, in, in the Western world. And that has allowed me to explore, and my motivation for it was that I realized that not only um, was my thinking need to be different, I needed to challenge myself to be really opening up in a very different form. And so that's what I did. I went on that, that journey and tried to find a way of reconnecting with nature. And what it's made me realize is that I do need to shift my identity. Maybe I'm going to become a healer in shamanic practice something completely different that allows the heart and the head and the soul to come out in helping people on their transformational journeys to help them face the enormity of the challenges that we are facing now. I don't know where it's going to lead. It's going to be an interesting journey. So that's the, the emergencies that I was facing in, in, in this journey as I've moved along in my career over 20, 25 years. Um, and, and when I think about science, I think about it in those same ways. I think science is facing these three emergencies, just like most sectors in the world today. Given the enormity of the challenges that we're facing, if we want a science for life that is really dedicated to ensuring the longevity of human life and many other species on this planet, we've got to tackle each of these three emergencies. How do we advance new ways of doing things? How do we change the deep assumptions that make it very difficult to do that? How do we shift the systems and structures that constrain us? And then it requires us to ask these very difficult questions. What is the purpose of science? And who do we need to be at the end of the world as we know it? We've got phenomenal capacity in science. We've got a huge amount of potential, even just in this room. How do we steer it in that direction? And I think we're going to have to address all of these three emergencies in order to be able to reach that potential. Thank you. Very well, perfectly on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, the next presentation is uh, remote, so please could you? Good morning, dear colleagues. First of all, let me thank the organization 
for this kind invitation to the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences and for allowing us to participate in this important debate, which is actually uh, going beyond the scope of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development and uh, meets directly an ongoing debate about the academic uh, reorganization of universities and the relations between universities and society on one hand and between uh, teaching and research. I would like to address five main uh, topics. First, where do we stand? Then, uh, what are basic sciences and science at large? What are we eventually are doing wrong? What do we need in terms of society and in terms of academia? And how to move ahead? The first uh, question where do we stand, our point of departure, is that uh, the beginning of the third millennium is largely characterized by a, a growing disconnection between individual's agency and institutional responses. We have seen positive effects of this, for example, in the, in the pandemic, when the majority of the world populations decided to design strategies to protect their lives and the lives of their neighbors, even in those countries where leaders didn't follow that path, which allowed for a significantly different uh, outcome of this pandemic when compared to the previous one a uh, hundred years ago, more or less. But we have also uh, negative expressions of this divide and, of course, mistrust in general and uh, mistrust in science in particular are uh, also uh, resu a result of this divide. So this is of course an important element when we think about science, education and the relations with society. And perhaps we should uh, go now to the second topic, which is what are basic science? Now, science, we could say it's a process uh, of structuring, st structuring a method or a set of methodologies, a methodological framework to analyze and interpret observed phenomena in a way that can be replicated by others. So this is a general context and in a second uh, outcome of scientific uh, uh, initiatives, apart from the analysis, the description and interpretation, there is also a contribution for a wider social uh, effort of foreseeing the possible future involvement of those phenomena and other consequences related to them. Of course, the second uh, component is not to be con confused with the first one. And because in the second one, other variables also intervene. Um, but of course, the second dimension is of a major relevance. And science became, particularly in the last few centuries, uh, a growing uh, component of the decision-making process related to what to do for the future. But of course, people understand that interpreting and analyzing what is being observed still provides room for different strategies to face the future. So keeping this in mind is important uh, also to understand our responsibilities and how we should address society at large. Basic or fundamental sciences are those that help improving the methodological framework and its conditions of validity. Uh, in a sense, those uh, fields of, of research that help improving uh, the criteria of truth and separating um, likely or truth, truthful 
uh, observations from false ones. Uh, this is a process again that is not merely resulting from observation or experimentation because that would be uh, a tautological approach uh, justifying the scientific process per se. Um, in, in science, we, we do not do that, uh, like in other domains, for example, religion, uh, but in fact, we integrate that with reasoning and with values. And this is why the process of uh, validation of uh, science is a complex and weak pro process. As a result, we uh, could say that basic sciences are, first of all, a crossroad of a robust language, a means of communication, of a reasoning framework, and of a capacity to communicate. Or to say this in different words, what in the old trivium was uh, listed as grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Then secondly, once this is the established basic framework of sciences, science, basic sciences are also a, a crossroad of quantification, cosmological and earth special analysis, and harmony for the understanding of reality, framing problems within a wider spatial and time series. So, uh, this is a, a complex second step, a very important, in which, for example, technology uh, builds from. And, of course, this relates to the old Padrivium, although improved with uh, the dimensions of arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, music, for an interesting reason, uh, and, of course, the, 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 the um, subdivisions of these that characterize the evolution of science in the last three centuries. Now, what are we eventually doing wrong? The process of structuring science is focused on the evolution of the quadrivium, if you wish, but neglected the trivium, forgetting that the trivium was actually the base of the whole system, not the purpose, but the base, the precondition. And uh, this old trivium is, to a certain extent, what is today uh, known as the humanities. But in fact, it's the base of science. And we have today a discussion, even trying to overcome <coughs> the disciplinary divide, which started by fostering STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, with a reading which was even uh, more restrict than the old quadrivium, and in later uh, attempts to uh, ameliorate the, the, the gaps of STEM, uh, as we know, there is a growing pressure to uh, move into the so-called STEAM model, adding the arts. But adding the arts is still the quadrivium. It's uh, still forgetting about the first layer of basic sciences. As a, a, a result of this, we became, in the last uh, decades, growingly good in describing the world, but also weaker in improving epistemology and the criteria of truth, namely when uh, dealing with new uh, scientific uh, contributions, particularly related to probabilistic uh, studies. We became weaker in, in relation to that uh, on methodology improvements, uh, particularly facing weak problems. And we became weaker in communication. And we largely replaced communication, science communication, which was very strong a hundred years ago. Think, for example, of the relevance of the world uh, exhibitions uh, that uh, were organized in different uh, countries in the US, in Europe, in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. These have disappeared, and to a large extent, what we call communication of science 
is today, unfortunately, propaganda. It's perceived as propaganda, as a revelation of truth, and not as a process of co-constructing the uh, conclusions and the reasoning with the society. So, although the quadrivium became uh, very fast integrated and interdisciplinary, we see that in domains from uh, biotechnology to the integrations of the various nano sciences, the trivium has been forgotten, leading to these growing divides and mistrust. This led then to growingly focus on short term problems because that's what the quadrivium does it isolates from the wider scope small problems to go deeper in the analysis. Aband but doing that, we also forgot growing, we abandoned actually addressing dilemma. And dilemma is what is more important in terms of foresight. While problems remain fundamental, of course, for contemporary societies, the main disputes relate to longer term dilemmas, which do not find solutions, but options. And the options have to be rooted in values and in priorities. And science is to, to play a role in this discussion cannot do so without the uh, integration of what we call today STEAM and the humanities, or if you wish, the uh, trivium and quadrivium or the liberal arts. The challenges imposed to humans from else to climate or inequality become integrated with those longer term dilemmas, such as how to imagine aging, uh, how to uh, manage the, the questioning of frontiers, of borders, how do we co-construct knowledge, etc. So what do we need? We need to frame the problems within the dilemma. The scale of problems is the reign of techniques and technology, and of the illusion that single solutions can encompass the world complexity. So this is the limitation of a quadrivium or a steam approach. The scale of dilemmas is the one that allows to build new values, and namely a notion of humanity, which is a major need in our society today, as an identity that goes beyond the biological dimension of humankind and allows to build convergence through diversity. And this requires a trivium. And this has a direct relation with the, the role of basic sciences for society. I give you two examples. One is the pandemic, in which good results were obtained in designing medical tools, but our societies failed in terms of social implementation across the globe. Another example is the dealing with global warming, in which we have important retrieved data uh, foreseen consequences, but we are failing in terms of building and co-constructing uh, uh, an adaptation strategy, which can only be built on the basis of a new utopia, a new vision of the future, and not an apocalyptic negativist discourse, which is often what the population societies listen from uh, scientists. So how do we move ahead? We move ahead towards a further integration. And so what we have done so far, particularly in terms of STEM and STEAM, is positive per se, but it's insufficient. We need to go deeper in that. The longer time uh, dimension is actually the reign of basic and fundamental sciences. And we need to structure our universities and our teachings doing something that we all understand is already in progress. Mathematics and philosophy, for example, sciences and history, life sciences with anthropology and social and human sciences, etc. The divide between humanities and sciences still makes sense 
in the same way that the, dis the distinction between the trivium and the quadrivium makes sense. But the development of scientific uh, disciplines and scientific work is impossible if it's limited to the applied and the quantified quantification sciences. Revisiting the centrality of basic sciences beyond restricted compromises that do not fully encapsulate their integrity, like STEM or even STEAM, is actually a fundamental priority for restoring the credibility of science and using the German word Wissenschaft, which is probably uh, a better way, a, a, a better concept to uh, go beyond a limited, restricted understanding of, of, of science. Uh, this is all I wanted to bring to, the, to you today. I'm very sorry I'm unable to participate online in the debate, but I congratulate again the organization. This is a very important international year, uh, and uh, I, I do hope that in the end you will have all, we will have all, a good balance of its outcomes. Thank you very much. Oh, very good. Now we can go to the last presentation. Um, Dragan Durisin, thank you very much. You have 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm fully aware that I'm between you and lunch and uh, I will strictly follow <laughs> the time restrictions. Uh, but I, I try to make the substance of possible solutions in my presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for Program Committee for the opportunity to participate in this, let's say, fabulous event. Uh, to share some ideas about existential threat we are facing in uh, in competent and highly diversified environment. Uh, the core intention of my contribution to this panel is to explain by some charts and some insights how economic neoliberalism is flipping economic script as well as impacting structural crisis or crisis in a system of crisis we are living in. Uh, actually, the presentation is super focused on key ideas about the context change through double paradigm change, both in micro and macro economics toward the sustainable and in inclusive growth, both toward the people and planet as a whole. I am an economist. Economics is a science of context, both micro and macro. And my suggestion is that economists have to admit that the big science development is precondition for sustainable and inclusive growth in the future. As a context thinker, I will concentrate over the double paradigm change by applying economic framework capable for sustainable and inclusive growth. Not turning learning into returning, which was the paradigm in the economic neoliberalism, but turning learning into mitigation of the fundamental problems uh, society facing. Impactful ideas about choices I proposed are based on the research of some respectable economists, old timers from the field, and the economists of the new generation. Also, some ideas are coming from some luminaries from other fields and my own research. I was inspired by the work of some thinkers from the Club of Rome and the World Academy of Science, along with Angelo Tartaglia and Carlos Pereira, one of the prominent physics, is moderator of this panel, Ugo Bardi, 
Hugo, thank you so much for inspiration. Let's have a look first on the world population trend. Red bottom part of the trend line refers to the long period of history with marginal increase of the number of people. Exponential growth started from 1784, actually from the beginning of the first industrial revolution. If you look at technological pro progress trajectory during the history, you can see almost exactly the same pattern. Namely, after the beginning of the first industrial revolution, the growth switched from linear to exponential one. In this period, the world population increased almost eight, eight times. We heard from the, my predecessors how was about the output and productivity and energy consumption. From early 1960s, the present day, the world's population more than doubled. Unfortunately, such dynamism in output growth and population growth did not respect natural limits. I like this chart. It's colorfully explained the point. This is the forecast for as is scenario of natural resources consumption until 2050. We see, for example, that United States or America needs 5.1 planets until 2050 to sustain the current model of growth. On the one hand, the limits to growth are obvious because we do not have enough natural resources. Because evident conundrum, the global economy has already gone into free fall. Namely, GDP growth is highly inflated and followed with many structural imbalances inside the economy. On the other hand, the world population continues to grow and it will reach 8 billion at the end of this year. This obviously challenging mismatch calls for serious responsibilities of architects of the economic system to provide adequate system to make some elements sustainable. In the 1972, the Club of Rome drew attention on unsustainable growth primarily due to finiteness of material and energy resources. Later on, same institution extended interest on the impact on greenhouse gas emissions on global warming. According to system dynamics, Hugo mentioned yesterday, the planet is closed, but not isolated system dynamics functioning under some unchangeable paradigm and laws of nature, as well as some changeable rules defined by people. The basic law in physical system of the planet states that matter and energy can never be created nor destroyed. At most, they could be transformed. Some amount of energy could be transformed in the dispersed heat as a sort of entropy or disorder. And this is the cause of our today's problems when we speak about climate change. Unlike what happens in the physical layer of the system dynamics and biosphere led by uh, progressive evolution. In economic layer, there is no role, there is no precise paradigm, there is no rules. Rules depend on people and balance of power. In neoliberal capitalism, for example, market fundamentalism is the framework for competition for all resources, including material resources and energy. Again, this last variant of economic theory doesn't consider fundamental contradiction of unlimited growth within natural boundaries. From microeconomic perspective, the key misconceptions of economic neoliberalism are as follows. 
a endogenous character of nature and technology change. Value maximization as a key consequence of so-called homo economicus, as a rational and consistent decision maker. And C, ignorance of negative externalities and mistreatment of public goods and public companies in disclosure of financial results. Neoliberal orthodoxies prescribe that nature and technology are endogenous factors affecting resource allocation, but not dependent on it. It is fundamental mistake and logical contra contradiction. Let's say oxymoron. In flow diagram describing linear model of growth, which is the consequence of such preconditions, we can see two successive filters on micro level, created value or shareholders value, and on macro level, GDP. In related economic structure, the nexus of rules is adjusted almost exclusively to private economic agents. Public companies are present in network technologies and natural monopolies or both. In the sectors out of interest of private companies, they are tolerated as infrastructure of private sector. Moreover, public sector is entropic, which means it produces losses. And actually, it is sitting on the carbon bubble. Two main problems are related to this model. First and foremost, value added is privatized. Negative externalities are socialized, which means that these abnormalities destroy human being and planet as a whole. Another important point of criticism concerning economic neoliberalism is economic policy platform, colloquially named Washington Consensus. In such platform, key macroeconomic rules are deregulation, liberalization, privatization, and globalization. Exclusive coordination mechanism is a visible hand of the market. And key policy target is inflation, low and stable. In such platform, two tire system of policy measure exists. First, the policy mix of in good times is based on neoliberal, neoliberal measures. And second, the policy mix in bad times, which is based on unconventional, means neo-Keynesian and experimental, means extreme neo-Keynesian measures like wage log, helicopter money, etc. Because they didn't work well, it is a good time to, to reconsider neoliberal economic rules, both on micro level and macro level. Simplify to extreme improvement doesn't make sense. Double paradigm change is, is inescapable. Here is, uh, is the list of the inbuilt structural imbalances of economic neoliberalism, financialization, deindustrialization, along with outsourcing and offshoring, economic inequality, investment myopia, and last but not least, destruction of, of material world. New economics must not be confused by ideology of market fundamentalism anymore. The economic system could be sustainable and inclusive. Only if it could be based on A, circular processes and reversibility principle by analogy of physical system and with adaptive evolution by analogy with functioning of biosphere as creation of humans, which is changeable. Economic system will be in harmony with anatomy 
and physiology of the nature. So neoliberal economics rules should be reconsidered, and there are some key directions. First, technology and nature should be considered in economic script as exogenous variables, not endogenous variables. Second, it is a false proposition that well-being is the first derivative of egoism which behavioral economists in, in last 40 years has eloquently confirmed, supported strongly by the results based on empirical tests from neurophysiology and neuropsychology. People are, in some choices, irrational and not consistent. Moreover, there is no symmetry between risk and reward, what orthodoxies in neoliberal theory prescribe. Also, there is a need to adopt economic policy platform to the new reality of contactless economy and its characteristics such as universal connectivity, disruptive innovations, and winners take all effects strategy of industrial leaders against improvements. Previous matchmaking requires catalytic role of the state in determining research frontiers, as well as in coordinated effort regarding financing of big science. We know destination and path in this endeavor. Destination is net zero by 2050, and the path is green transition because it's fully committed with 1.5 degrees centigrade threshold. The pillars of this system are circular model of growth, heterodox economic policy platform, new system of performance measurement, and new model of financing. Uh, as for circular model of growth, non-linear system are all around us, including economics. Majority of participants of this event coming from big science. Economics is also a linear system when universal connectivity is a basic free good no land, uh, uh, water, and earth, but universal connectivity. The circular model of growth is actually the antonym of linear model of growth. We can see from the flow diagram multiple feedback loops and functioning of the system. Five minutes. Five minutes more or you still have five minutes. If five minutes, OK. Them, so I am, I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, we see also two sub-cycles in a linear model of growth, biogeochemical in production and the reversal of produced input. The model promotes combinatorial innovations from the industry 4.0 as amalgams of big science break through from virtual, physical, and biological spheres. And the best example of this is RNA messenger in pro production of vaccine and cancer treatment. Five rules also exist in circular economy, recycle, remanufacture, refurbish, repair, and reuse. And also this is the framework for performance measurement system. As for heterodox policy platform, let's start with semantic. The term heterodox means that the visible hand of the state is complementary with invisible hand of the market. Increase in coordination effort is a consequence of the greater role of the state in economy, particularly in lineup of industrial policies, both in horizontal and vertical, and impact investment treatment of core macroeconomic policies on structural ways 
and lay-up of uh, economic stabilizers as liaison between structural and core economic policies. We can see from the flow diagram that in all decision points, feedback loops are functioning, which was the point. As for financing, to attack the causes of climate change requires quantum leap in funds, switch from billion to trillion. According to McKinsey, the, the report from February this year, the green transition will require 275 trillion of US dollars. Also, the previous means a large scale of reallocation of the capital inside the financial system and also using of different channels of monetary transmission. Uh, for example, green QE instead QE, green QE, green quantitative easy. So multi-pronged approach by using different financing models is needed. This is the uh, way of calculation of one performance measure, one of 21, de uh, decided by the uh, World Economic Forum and uh, implemented uh, in uh, uh, international uh, financial reported standards foundation. Integral reporting is the last one of this uh, pocket. Uh, along with other things, the integral reporting could also help to make the change towards equitable well-being with the sustainable planet, uh, focusing on results, but measuring the impact on climate change and respect toward the global standards. Ladies and gentlemen, under the existential threat we are exposed to in last decade, key question looking for the answer is who will survive? Shareholders, capitalism and capital markets at the center, or humanity and the planet as a whole with sustainability and well-being in the center? To conclude, this framework I present today is a teeny part of what has to be done to double paradigm change in economics. But the tricky question is who will take responsibility for these radical changes when we know that we are living in a time of tremendous geopolitical disputes? Without settlement of geopolitical disputes, all these concepts and targets will be quite hypothetical. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the speakers and the public. And uh, we had a very interesting session, which goes to the core, I think, of what we are trying to do with this conference to try to understand how science, and especially basic science, can be used, understood, managed in such a way to obtain those entities that we call paradigms. Because then a paradigm is something that everybody accepts. And then we need agreement, we need acceptance if we have to use science to act on the problems that uh, we face big problems that we have right now. So uh, we have about 15 minutes for a discussion and I would invite questions now. My name is Marcel Vardeforte. I'm here as a trustee of VAS, but before I was working at CERN in Geneva, Max Planck Institutes and European Union. I'd like to bring to the panel. During the last 25 years, without speaking of earlier before, the research what we have been doing was mediocre research, mediocre technology. But in the next 25 years, 50 years, that will be revolutionary. If I look about myself, I'm working in the quantum computer, quantum computer. 
I'm also into the nano science, but also in the tarot science, where nobody is today thinking on that one. On the other side, in the medical world, we have to solve a number of problems, like cancer. We cannot live with cancer anymore in the future. It's unbelievable that we as scientists have not yet solved it. The same thing for Alzheimer and many other medical points, but also in the industry, etc. Yeah, and now the I'm, point I'm, what I wanted to make. It's very interesting, but the question. Yeah. Now the point is for the, 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 the and then in addition to that one, the international uh, competition between China, Russia, and so on in, in science and so. So, what we can expect in the future? How how are we guiding these scientists? What mechanisms should be done? One has now been saying in that conference, this has to be done, one has to think on that one. But are the mechanisms in all to do it? What is the guideline, the booklet for all the scientists of the future? And also the younger scientists, they are thinking on their Nobel Prize winner, they are looking on all that one. How how are we going to change all the science community in the whole world? That is the question what I have, and I think it might be useful to reflect on it. And without forgetting that the energy, we will reduce that, but the new energy systems will tell, physics will tell, you cannot do that. Or it will be rare of metals are not available, and we cannot go. What do we use for the luxurious future of the great population in future? Thank you. Thank you. Some of the panelists would like to answer. Maybe you would like to comment, Johan. <laughs> microphone. Here. That's okay. It's better functioning. Can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Great. Uh, what a challenging question that one is. I'm not sure I fully know the answer, but um, <laughs> what what I what I. For me, what it's meant is, is really being able to step back and reflect back in. So we have to bring that reflection back on what it means to be science and to be scientists in the world that's changing. And um, just a really simple example of that is just answering the questions back on oneself. You know, you've kind of started to answer the question, what is the economics of economics? What is the, how sustainable is our sustainability science? And actually build those reflections back in there. And somehow that needs to be unleashed and, and removed. It doesn't answer the, the question and the big challenge that you, you've got there. And then the other part of it comes back to what I was saying about the how. You're asking a how question. That in itself is a research question. How can we do that? We might not know the answers now, but we need to start putting the resources into answering those how questions. And then that requires us to really that reflection part to go back and say what does that mean i was once at a major science meeting and, and social science meeting i'm not going to say which one it was um, but i'd said some similar things about shifting and questions to the how and i overheard a conversation of, of of scientists worried about losing their funding because it will all go to the social science right and that's a real fear but that's a fear we have to start addressing and, and, and dealing with if, if we want to be serious about addressing these, these questions and challenges. Because nothing will stay the same. Science won't stay the same. And then the fourth point I guess I would have is that then it's also about aligning the change. So there's lots of change happening around the world. So it's then about how do you align it to the shifts and the changes that are already happening. So you, you're not trying to go entirely against the stream because we can't control it. But then you're trying to find a way of doing it that goes back to complexity and how we work with complex systems and, and negotiations and, and so on. So no direct answer there, I'm afraid, and solution, but at least hopefully that gives some pointers about how we might try and figure it out. Thank you. We still have time for a couple of questions, please. Yeah, hi. If possible, uh, Nero Hart from Tel Aviv University. I think we need to divide our discussion into immediate, midterm, and long-term response of the community. I think on the immediate range of time, we have to step on the brakes. We need to come up as scientists and say a word, say that we cannot continue as we're doing it today, to our politicians, to whoever is in charge of what's happening around us. And then in the midterm, we can utilize whatever we know to do now, but turn them into bettering what we do. And this is some of the things you have discussed. And then the last question is, to the long term. And, and I guess that what Ian just proposed is related to that. 
So I'll be happy to hear what you think about how do we approach, right now approaches midterm and long term. Who would like to comment? Do you want to comment? If you like. Yeah, thanks. I think actually what you're describing is what some of the met futures methods that we'd use to do that. So um, one of the methods that I use looks at the three different forms of knowledge that I mentioned earlier. And it goes back to the imaginaries. What do we imagine? What would you want to see is really important. And then it's, it's, it's then looking at the, uh, the current situation and recognizing there is that requires in itself a systemic change. And then you can get into the actions, but with the sense that you're trying to get a systemic change rather than an incremental change. The danger is that we don't put the effort into really understanding the contrast, the difference that we're really after, um, and, uh, and therefore continue to improve the status quo rather than change the status quo. And so that, that becomes uh, in there. But yes, I would agree with, with the sort of take you've got on there, but adding in, you have to have that long-term goal in mind. It's a stretch goal. It's like going to the moon. You know, it's going to be a challenge. But you have to, if you don't have that coherence for transformation in that, then it becomes very, very difficult. Thank you. I'm Luc Berger. I'm, I am the president of the European Physical Society. So I have a question for Niboja Nakinovic. Nakinovic, for, OK. Uh, Nakinovic, sorry. For, uh, it's about, I mean, the new European Ban House initiative you talked about at the end of your talk. I mean, could you please tell us more about the projects uh, you are leading? Uh, uh, what is the nature of these projects? Um, I have heard about the Lighthouse projects that concern more than 10 universities in Europe. And uh, what is the funding uh, system? What is the budget? And uh, did you already receive any feedback from this initiative? Thanks. Yeah, I'll just give a, a short answer because we are short of time, uh, okay, but okay, maybe we, we can ever. talk during the pause. Uh, 100 years ago was the original Bauhaus project. The idea was to put together science, artists, and people to design an environment that's people friendly, that is beautiful, but also functional and at the same time sustainable in modern language. And this is the new initiative now that European Commission has taken on board, rooted in the European Green Deal to do exactly that their prices for architects. But I think what is the key is that it's an interdisciplinary, in the sense of our conference, interdisciplinary activity to build a better environment, including mobility and everything else, with the emphasis on reuse, recycling, natural materials. So I think in that sense, is a big challenge for all of us. And in my view, would be a huge opportunity for rebuilding our environment over the next decades, what we must do to be net zero and sustainable. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Anna Kasli from UNESCO, and uh, actually I wanted to ask you one, but the question uh, can be also for all scientists and for everyone. Uh, but I, would, I wanted to ask him because of the surveys that you showed. Uh, so um, we talk about the changes and how we can monitor these changes and how we can find solutions, but the changes are mostly happening because of what the people do in general. So my main concern was always how can we reach the public outside our this closed community. So we always talk in these uh, conferences and uh, the public sometimes if uh, there is an issue that they don't understand, they accuse the scientists that they live in their own world and they don't actually explain to them what the issues are. And I, I strongly believe that if we um, became more open to the public in order, in order to understand uh, how these changes are happening, maybe we might receive some uh, impact on how to address these changes and how to make them positive rather than negative. Do you think from the surveys that you, you, you have done, do you think this is true? Do you think it's possible? And do you think, uh, and how can actually, how can we get out of this bubble and uh, create more interaction with the public outside the scientific field? Thank you. You, you want me to answer? Somebody else? Yeah, go for it. You want to go first? No, no, it's okay. Oh, 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think one of the huge challenges that we have, um, I cannot do a justice in a very brief response, but I think it's the key, of course, to build out on the different forms of knowledge, to be inclusive. Citizen science, I think, is one of the areas. But most importantly, in my view, is also to work with people in the other professions, artists. So at the end of the day, my take would be uh, that we need to, take, uh, to develop a positive narrative a kind of a co-benefit story, why this is all important. I think in the past we have been using quite a lot the language of, you know, barriers, limits, difficulties, Herculean efforts. It all sounds like almost impossible. I think to, we need to reach the hearts of the people in some ways with science that is not silent uh, and that is, I think, very close to the people to uh, des describe how the future can be beneficial to all of us. And I think that is important because because many of us, I think, believe that, you know, we need to have a strong relationship to the policy and the private sector. I believe that as well, but it's not enough because they have a different cycles than science. Science is a long term and they like to have usually very short, short term decisions and we take time to develop the answers. One last question. Uh, Sorry, my name is Blast of Horror. I'm Minister of Notre Dame, USA. So uh, I have the feeling that you are preaching to converted people. You know? Because if I look around, the scientists who we are here, I think we have several characteristics. To be free, free in choice our uh, topics. To be creative, to be honest, and to be engaged. And without that, we can't do science seriously. You know? So what should we change? You know? I am my son who is just starting his career in physics, and I tell him the same thing. Creative, uh, honest, free, and engaged. So what else could you add to this? This is the first thing. The second thing that I wanted to, uh, well, I had this idea uh, listening to this morning that uh, there is really a mismatch between scientific world and politics. So we scientists, we know what to do, we have good strategy, but we don't have the power. The politicians have the power, but they don't have the knowledge or the ears, or they have different agenda. So shouldn't we go, I mean, we pol uh, scientists, shouldn't we go to politics? Maybe I can try to, to make answer on the second question. Uh, my feeling is that we are on the uh, brink of the new era of, let me say, scientification of politicians. If you like to, to lead the country, you must know the fundamental processes in the science. Because uh, the big science is not a curiosity driven activity. This is not luxury of uh, rich countries. Uh, the big science is a, a solution provider. So economy is uh, functioning on a very simple way, with sticks and carrots, with initiatives and uh, subsidies. So if uh, politicians define the right side to rules, like a Green New Deal in Europe, and find uh, uh, the institution providing some kind of support, we are on the right way. If uh, populism and geopolitical uh, playing a game uh, dominate uh, uh, top uh, politicians' activities, uh, we have a problem. All right, so I see that there are more questions, but I think we should stop now because it's um, time to stop and uh, glad that you have been interested in this session, which it was indeed interesting. You can raise up uh, and uh, jump if you like to, to ease the... <laughs>